Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Cave of the Cross Apologetics. I'm Patrick. And I'm Tony. And uh, we're in the midst of uh, uh, Apologetics, a Justification of Christian Belief by John Frame. And he uh, uh, has started to um, present the argument, uh, morality, therefore God, as one of the best uh, um, uh, proofs of God's existence, a theistic argument. And uh, we're just kind of getting to unpack uh, uh what he means by that and so we've 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 traveled and 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 kind of taken down some of the the obvious ones like uh, uh an ought doesn't imply an is uh, meaning that uh or what is it doesn't imply an ought uh meaning that uh just because uh something uh, uh happens doesn't mean that we should do it if it provides us good or bad it there's there's no uh, value system uh, opposed to an is like uh, we gave the example of, of throwing a, a ball at a at a window pane that isn't ours, um, it, we we can say that it breaks, but we can't say if if it's not ours, should we even throw the ball? Uh, and we also talked about the uh, subjectivity of of uh, my subjectivity of of moral arguments, and uh, everyone has their own subjective value. Uh, we we view that as. Uh, uh, other people's as, as icky values that don't match ours, but we don't ever apply that to ours. And then uh, we don't take uh, cultural uh, uh, values because uh, th- something like robbery uh, is uh, uh, unethical for anyone, depending uh, uh, regardless of, of where they might be or when they might be. And we just don't talk about that. And so here he comes <clears throat> And he talks about the the main question is a question of authority of principles. So why should we give to it a, a, a enormous respect that indeed we give it? Ultimately, any two kinds of answers are possible. And he says the the source is either this: it's either absolute moral authority is either personal or it is impersonal. And so from here, we're going to uh, figure out uh, whether the source of moral authority uh, can be derived from the universe or if it has an, an, another source in and of itself. And so he begins, uh, we'll, we'll start in where he said, where he, you know, after he's made this distinction, he says, mm-hmm. consider the first, uh, the, the latter possibility, right? That um, source of morality is uh, impersonal. That would mean that there is some impersonal structure or law in the universe that sets forth ethical precepts and rightly demands allegiance to them, right? If, if uh, morality comes from an impersonal source. But then he asks the question, what kind of impersonal being could possibly do that? <laughs> Certainly, if the laws of the universe reduce to chance, nothing of ethical significance could emerge from it, right? right? I mean, uh, what uh, of ethical significance could we learn from it? He tells us random, you know, collisions of subatomic particles. Like what what loyalty <laughs> would we <laughs> owe to pure chance? Right? How can <laughs> an impersonal structure create obligation? Right? Right. And, right, and but- he says, actually, what this really does is gets us right back into the is art problem, right? Right. We have right. something that is an impersonal structure, and we're attempting to get an art from it. And so impersonal doesn't seem to work in terms of the source of morality that's what he's giving right we can set our clocks by the vibration of the cesium uh, uh atom and uh it, it's really really good uh, but it doesn't tell us if we should be uh late for the, our uh kids uh, school play that we might not want to go to so the the <laughs> is ought uh, is 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 honed in right there Right. The fact is that an impersonal principle is insufficient to create an ought, something that we must do or should do to rightly demand loyalty and obedience. Why, why should I listen to the vibration of a cesium atom? And it just sits there and vibrates and I look at my watch, but I don't do anything. There, there's nothing that that forces me to then be on time. When then does the ought come from? What is there that is capable of imposing an absolute obligation on human beings. Well, for this answer, we'll leave the realm of the impersonal principle and turn to the realm of persons. Obligations and loyalties arise in the context of interpersonal relationships. I have an obligation to go to my child's school play, and 
uh, once once you have young children, you actually like those cheesy productions, and it's very cute. And you <laughs> yeah. you end up going aw with everybody yeah. else. And to, that's why. And, and, it's, and, it's and as a dad, that, that that's why that's why cell phones were invented. It was created by a dad so that we would have an easier way of not getting in the way of other dads taking videos of it because we all take videos of those. <laughs> <laughs> but but the the relationship aspect is is what creates the ought. I tell you that I'm going to purchase a house from you for $10,000, be either a bad house or I'm taking advantage of you. You say, I agree to that. And we have an exchange. If one side doesn't uh, um, uh, uh, fulfill their obligation, then it's an unethical uh, uh, point of view. And and so um, that interpersonal relationship is what drives that ought. I ought right, to do right. this thing because this other person is involved. Exactly. In fact, his his example is, right. for instance, I receive a bill from a man who has uh, repaired my roof, right? And I feel an obligation to pay it. Uh, when we agreed that, uh, you know, that he would fix the roof, I promised to pay him. Well, that promise, he's, he tells us, creates an obligation. And I would have little respect for myself, he says, if I did not keep that promise. Also, uh, we learn morality typically in the family. And so this is another deeply personal, what he calls, covenantial environment. Right. And so this relational, covenantial type of environment is is uh, that is part of personal relationships. And that's the source. Something that's personal, personal relationship. Mm -hmm. he's, he's arguing is the source of morale. Right. Right. We, we, we wouldn't get very far if we told our neighbors, yeah, I'd, I'd pay the guy that did a really good job on on my roof. But, uh, you know, that, that just doesn't uh, that doesn't comport with my morality. Uh, your neighbors are not going to your neighbors aren't going to say, well, you know, what's true for him isn't always true for us. So, all right. <laughs> our obligations to the repairman and even to parents are not absolute. If the repairman's bill is 10 times his estimate, a higher moral arbiter, the court, might have to be involved. If parents tell a son to murder somebody, it is best that he <laughs> resort to a higher moral authorities, perhaps to his absolute or ultimate moral authority, because uh, we talked about uh, um, um, moral agents uh, or, or moral our moral standards, our ethical standards are hierarchical. And so, you know, we, we, we might put, uh, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's uh, not right to cross the street. Uh, uh, with uh, not in the crosswalk, but I also can do it if a child is in the way, and I can uh go when the light uh is the is the red stop sign, and uh, I I rescue that that child from impending doom. I can't. It, right. it would be uh, wrong for me to say, well, you know, all ethical standards are alike, and so I can't jaywalk. But where does this authority come from? Where is this ultimate standard or moral authority? Uh, derived from and and something that it appears that we all uh, have or or yeah. view because because the, the the reasons that we apply a moral statement uh, and has risen uh, to prominent here of in discussion is because uh, so much of our day to day activities are moral things and he's he's presented that fact as well but he, when we're even talking in day to day life the the if you turn on the news and, and even the people you disagree with are making moral claims and moral authorities, but not everyone out there, especially in the press, are are God fearing people. And so where does this this uh, obligation to each other come from if everything's just, well, you know, you do what you do and I do what I do? No, there there is this uh, covenantal aspect to it. But where does it come from? Exactly. So how do we get to this absolute ultimate moral authority? Well, he tells us that, uh, you know, if his reasoning so far has been correct, then that authority, this absolute ultimate authority, can come only from what he called in chapter two, a personal absolute, right? It's a relational type of thing. Or he also called it an absolute personality. If right. obligations arrive from personal relationships, then absolute obligations must arrive from a relationship with an absolute person. There it is, right? Moral standards, therefore, presuppose absolute moral standards, which in turn presuppose the existence of an absolute personality. In other words, moral standards presuppose the existence of God. That's that's where he's headed. So this is morality, therefore God, right? That's that's what he's aiming. 
I am an absolutely perfect parent. And so my children should always obey me no matter what. There, there's no other apex there. Okay. Maybe there is. And he actually discusses that, that point, which uh, I thought was a good critique uh, of, of what uh, someone would, would, would uh, claim. And we'll get into that in a little bit later here. But other divine attributes too are evident from the logic of the moral argument, attributes of God. The fact that God himself thinks, knows, plans, and speaks is evident from the very meaning of personhood, right? It, it, that, that, uh, that aspect has, uh, has repercussions uh, by saying a, 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 a personal being exists. Well, what of that? So he knows, plans, speaks, and that's evident in, in the meaning of personhood. God's justice is Im implicit in the fact that he is the very source, the very definition of moral standards. We talked about this with Mitch Stokes, and he has kind of a different way of, of answering this. But uh, ultimately, the, 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 the moral standards are derived from God's own character that he then reveals to us in his work. Right, right. And so uh, Frame points out that this is a transcendental argument. Hey, right? look, it's there. He's <laughs> yeah, okay with it. Got Got to back <laughs> yourself into tag. Right? <laughs> so rather than offering, you know, he's a straightforward empirical evidence for God, right? Uh, this argument asks the deeper question. What must be the case uh, for morality to be possible? That's what this argument is, right? And and that's, that's a transcendental type of argument. What has to be the case for morality to exist? Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he's uh, so it's 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 uh, it's the the step be, be in back of the question. Here are empirical evidences of God. It's it's the one that's in back of that. Well, what has to be the case for morality to exist? He says now the argument, of course, does not prevent anyone from choosing unbelief. Right? It doesn't force somebody to believe in God. Right. You no know, one can. And uh, do that, uh, you know, in the face of any argument, we can still be, you know, refuse to believe it, no right. matter how strong the argument may be. Right? So it doesn't really force belief, is, is what he's getting. At. Yeah, it's 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 not a magic spell that we can cast and uh, we <laughs> can say the transcendental argument and it forces them to robotically get up and bend their knee at the, at the altar. Right. Right. So the choice is this, either accept the God of the Bible or... Deny objective morality, objective truth, the rationality of man, and the rational knowability of the universe. Those are some, some big keys that uh, that yeah. would, would go away from the 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 denial of of this uh, of this argument. Thus, let no one say that Christianity lacks a rational basis, or that the non-Christian covenantal wisdom is more rational than Christianity. Well, you know, just yes, people exist, therefore we have obligation. Well, well no, hold on. Why? Where, where does where? I, I sign a, an agreement with somebody else and now I'm obligated. Can, can you, can you tell me why that's the case? <laughs> well, it, because society would crumble. Well, I don't care about society. I don't want to, I don't want to pay three times the market rate for the, the agreement that, that I have here. But uh, you know, now, now I've signed my name on the line and also signing your name on the line. What, what is, what is putting my name on a, on a dotted line do? Uh, how is that <laughs> even Great. Or like I get up in front of a, a court and I say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And I raise my hand. What, you know, why are all these things here? Well, they all harken back to a Christian understanding of this, this uh, uh, covenantal aspect of uh, truth telling of, of moral agency of, of, of moral absolutes that, uh, that have carried on, uh, us along for, for this well. And, and, uh, now we're providing uh, the basis uh, for that, the justification for for that, and so uh, right. the other side should as well. All right. So personal and personal relationships uh, allow for morality, and then ultimate moral principles come from an ultimate relationship, and that's how he gets us to God. Yeah. So the question is, you know, what has to be the case for morality to exist? Well, we have to have an ultimate personality in order for us to have those types of ultimate uh, obligations. Now, he's a good philosopher, and so <laughs> he realizes that there may be objections to what uh, he has to say, right? And so the, what he does now is he uh, deals with uh, or raises one of those objections to his position, right? 
And he says, we come to a problem that emerges when we say that God is the ultimate standard of ethical value and obligation. Right? When we ascribe goodness to God, so here's the problem. When we ascribe goodness to God and also make him the standard for identifying and evaluating goodness, then the two statements generate a circularity. Right? Oh, circularity. So if we, we just can't get that, around it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So here's this illustration. He says, if we say that box music is the greatest ever written, right, and, and uh, I make a meaningful, if disputable claim when I say that, box music is the greatest ever written. But if someone asks me my criteria for greatness in music and I reply, well, how like box music is it? <laughs> right. Right. So now the significance, he says, of my claim seems to be reduced. Box superiority then becomes tautological and trivial, you know, uh, uh, for, uh, of course, all composers. Box music is most like box music. And so any <laughs> any any composer that has a music like box, then it is superior music. Well, now right. we're, you know, we backed ourselves into a circle, basically, is what he's saying. <laughs> right. When a we're vicious, using vicious, the sir. standard in order to judge the standard. Right, right. That's that's the problem. Well, similarly, some have argued that when we say God is good, but then make God the standard or criterion of goodness, we make the initial claim meaningless. If we say both God is good and good is whatever God is, then God's goodness could be anything at all, right? So Plato in Euthro uh, uh, poses the, the question whether piety is what the gods say it is or whether the gods command piety because of its intrinsic nature apart from their own wishes. And some philosophers have identified a similar problem in biblical theism. If good is what God says, then goodness is subject to arbitrary whims of a personal deity. God God declares that Robert is wrong because he had uh, tacos on Tuesday. And so uh, <laughs> that, that's the only reason. Or uh, uh, if goodness is independent of God, then he is subordinate. So, uh, you know, robbery is wrong because from the ether, I've pulled it out uh, as a universal truth of, of this universe that I'm in. And I'm uh, bequeathing it to the people of this universe. Well, then he is subordinate to that abstract concept of goodness. So therefore, God doesn't exist, right? Right. Or at least the traditional concept of God has to be modified because now something is superior to God. Right. And then, right. And so the Greek version of God. This, OK, yeah, no, no, no Greeks. All right. Gotcha. And that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so we're caught into and this, you know, obviously this is the uh, what's came to be known as a youthful dilemma. Right. It, uh, is, you know, is uh, is good, good because uh, the gods say it is or do the gods say it is because it's good. That's, that's the issue. Here. Right. And he says the same kind of dilemma now confronts the uh, uh, the Christian, the, the believer in God. Right? All right. And so now how do, and, and obviously Plato lands on good is independent of God. It's something that exists outside of, you know, the authorities of uh, uh, of God. And so um, that's where Plato lands in this dilemma. So it's not whatever God commands. It's something that's superior to God. It's independent of God. It exists outside of uh, uh, God's authority. Of course, you know, uh, believers, Christian believers can't accept that. And so what's the problem here? Well, French says that in his view, this problem arises from the inability of Plato and other philosophers to see goodness as, notice this, something personal. Mm -hmm. Many of them never seem to question the view that such things as goodness and truth are impersonal, right? They reason that since goodness is an abstract entity, then it cannot be identical with a person. And he thinks that that's a problem with that kind of reason. Yeah, which is odd because, you know, if, if it's a virtue, the virtues are this, you know, uh, personal representations of of different things. And, uh, uh, you know, if you've, you've watched the Disney's Hercules that you have, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the um, virtues there as well. Um, but so, yeah, so the the the, the personal aspect of it uh, is is lost in uh, this uh, Greek concept of of, uh, of of goodness or of piety. Yeah. All right, so goodness is the behavior and self-revelation of a person, not a general or abstract concept. 
Certainly, it would be wrong to regard the behavior of any mere human being as the criterion of goodness. There's my joke about being the perfect parent. But of course, God is unique. He's a unique being, right? He's, he's so unique that he has a moniker that we call him God, right? So the good is not, as in Plato's view, an abstract form superior to God. It is the, the good, then, what God says it is? Well, yes, but God's word is not arbitrary. God com- commends goodness to us because he is himself supremely good. He commands to us based on what he himself is from, from his personhood. So it's true to say that goodness is what God says it is, and it is also true to say that God commands the good because it is good, because it's rooted in himself, his character, his being, that, that he is the standard. Yeah, exactly. So this might be, you know, uh, somewhat circular, and he's going to deal with this in a minute here, right. but it's not viciously circular. In other words, the good comes out of not what God commands, but out of God's character. It's who God is. That's, that's the source of goodness. And, and notice he says that a mere human being cannot be the standard of goodness because uh, his nature is not perfect, right? God's is. Uh, the human being's commands would indeed be subject to the uh, suspicion of arbitrariness, right? Because we don't have a divine, perfect nature. And right. so our commands would be subject to the arbitrary objection, right? Mm-hmm. As finite and fallen creatures, you know, a person might indeed declare what is good today, you know, be bad tomorrow, this arbitrary issue. But God, he says, and God's word cannot be arbitrary in this way, for God is supremely and unchangeably good. So good comes from God's character and his commands. Unlike us, God has a perfect moral character. We do not. And so basically when we have this kind of dilemma, we're almost comparing God to, to people. We say, you know, we can arbitrarily say anything and it becomes right. good. So, yeah. uh, but the problem is, yes, that's the way it works for us because our character is not perfect. God has a perfect moral here. And so it's a different uh, kind of uh, issue. Right. It's, it's a standard. It's, it's the ruler that, that measures all things that's created in uh, and kept in this, uh, uh, you know, temperature controlled room that, uh, I guess we get it out if uh, uh, gas stations have <laughs> have issues with how much gas it dispenses or, or something along those lines. Well, okay, a form of circularity here is unavoidable, and we've kind of discussed this uh, before, but uh, it, it bears repeating here, especially from Frame. Does the circularity fall play to the criticism that apply to the examples that he's mentioned above, like uh, regarding uh, Bach? Bach is good because he sounds like Bach. Does it sound like Bach? Yes, therefore it's good because it sounds like Bach. Great. Well, he says, I think not. And he says, for these reasons, the circularity is very similar to the circularity that he's discussed earlier with it not being a, a vicious kind that, uh, you know, the ultimate standard will ultimately be the thing that you always apply to. And if you would go above that, then it's not your ultimate standard. So you have to come to some peak at some point, or that's not ultimately your ultimate standard when we ask you, well, what's your ultimate standard? There is always kind of a circularity when we are dealing with an ultimate standard. If one standards of the truth is human reason. One can argue for that standard only by a rational argument, an argument that presupposes the truth of its conclusion. But similarly, right. if, if right. God, and so, yeah. you know, if reason is your standard, then how do you defend that standard? Right. Well, you give them a, a, an argument based on reason. Well, you're falling into circularity. <laughs> right. Right? So we right back into circularity. In other words, anytime you're using an ultimate standard, as a standard, there is a certain amount of circularity that's involved in that. That's the issue that he's he's bringing out here. Mm-hmm. Right. And then does your system allow for it? Well, I, I do because it's helpful to me. Well, okay, then God exists because it's helpful to me then. So therefore God exists. Great. Well, no, no, you didn't prove it. Well, you didn't prove it either. So you know, yeah, you didn't prove that reason <laughs> outside of reason is reasonable. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good. Great. (laughs) So, but similarly, if God is the supreme standard of truth and rationality, one may argue for that standard only by presupposing it. And so he says this, this, uh, the same circularity is present in any attempt, Christian or non-Christian, to establish uh, the criteria of goodness. Mm -hmm. 
So let's say that someone tries to prove that goodness is an abstract form without any personal exemplification. Well, if his abstract form is indeed the supreme standard, then he must show the content of the abstract form to be good by reference to the abstract form, right? And of course, that argument is circular as well. So anytime we have an ultimate standard as, as, a, as a way to determine something, we have to use, we use the ultimate standard in order to show that the ultimate standard is the ultimate standard. And yes, a certain amount of circularity is involved in that. So you can't get around that with regard to ultimate standards. Mm -hmm. The point he's trying to make it. Right, right. So some might argue that circularity still presents a problem despite the observations above. For even though the circularity is shared by all religions and philosophies, they might say, it is still circularity and therefore objectionable. Right. But if it is, the whole enterprise of reason is invalidated and we are forced into radical skepticism. Yet mm. that sort mm. of objection is self-refuting. Exactly. If the circularity of reason invalidates reason itself, then it invalidates the objection as well. So I'm giving you a reason why reason isn't the reason, which, which <laughs> is my reason, but then I can't give you a reason. And so, right. So we, we, see, we see the contradiction there. Besides, skepticism itself is a self-refuting position. Any argument of, for skepticism presupposes some knowledge. Nope, I don't believe that. Oh, okay, so belief is something that you must hold in order for you to, to, uh, to, to ac accept it. Well, yes. Right. Well, oh, okay, do you believe that? Well, yes. Okay, so it, you know, th this, this <laughs> idea is then a rational argument, which you don't buy because that you don't hold to that belief. Okay, well, you know... The, 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 the trap has been sprung. Exactly. And so, you know, uh, he's now he's going through these various, you know, uh, uh, reasons why his, his position is, is the correct position. Right. He says, everything we know about God's goodness comes from him. God's revelation is both our ultimate criteria of truth and our sole source of knowledge about God's goodness. Mm -hmm. So we believe that God is good, then because God tells us that he's good, and so obviously there's a certain amount of circularity, but it's a it's a broad circularity, not a narrow one, right? It's a circularity loaded with content. He tells us right. it's full of evidence and richly persuasive. We are in fact, I have a book that you should powerful. read. You, you, you should read a, this book that I have. I have many on my shelves that yeah. that where he tells us about him. So let, let me give you a copy. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And we're literally surrounded, he tells us, by evidence of God's goodness. <laughs> and so, yes, this circularity uh, uh, objection seems to hold, but it doesn't have the strength that one would suggest that it does have. Right? right. When we're looking at ultimate authorities, there is a certain amount of circularity. And when we look at God as the ultimate source of goodness, there is a certain amount of circularity in terms of evaluating. But it's not a vicious circularity. He calls it a broad circularity. It's not narrow. And uh, and so he suggested that it's an acceptable kind of circularity, just like the circularity that we have when we're attempting to defend reason with reason. Mm -hmm. It's a circular argument. When we attempt to defend our uh, empirical perceptions, right, our sense perceptions, how do I know that I'm having these sense perceptions? Well, because I'm having sense perceptions, <laughs> right? It's a certain kind of circularity. Mm -hmm. So all those ultimate kinds of, you know, standards, when we attempt to defend them, we have to use them in order to defend them. And so there's a certain kind of circularity there. And he suggests it's, it's, it's broad and not a narrow. Right. Right. And then does the system that you propose as your worldview allow for those things? Because there are some worldviews uh, uh, Eastern ones that say, well, you know, the sense perception that you're having isn't actually there, but then again, <laughs> looks both ways before crossing the street on the busy, you know, on the busy street for the bus. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, can, can, and, and we discussed this with Nancy Piercy's book, uh, finding truth, uh, and, and, uh, other ones as well of, of showing a kind of, uh, for, from her perspective, kind of five points to, uh, evaluating worldviews as well. And, uh, and, and so that, that can be of service to you as well. And so here, uh, thus ends, uh, the, the John frames, um, moral case for God, uh, or moral proof for God, I guess. And, uh, uh, from here for the rest of the chapter that will continue next time, 
uh, he offers two more. So you get, a, a believe it or not, Frame gives you a Trinity type of argumentation. That's I know three that's, that's weird for Frame to, to talk <laughs> about Trinity, but uh, that, seems, <laughs> that seems to be the case even here. So, All right. so um, we have the moral argument. Yeah. And he's going to give us two more arguments next time. Yeah, which again will sound really suspicious for presuppositionalists as being <laughs> familiar, but also some classicalists will definitely uh, um, uh, applaud and appreciate uh, what Frame brings here. So, okay, um, uh, you have time to read ahead, and we'll give you another week to to finish uh, chapter five of Apologetics: August, uh, Justification for Christian Belief by John Frame. And so, we appreciate you, and uh, continue to check us out, and continue to read with us in our little book club that we have, and uh, we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time.